Hello everyone, George here, and this is the first in a two-part series on UART programming. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about UART, what it is, uh, look at the data sheet, and figure out how we're going to implement it properly. And in the second video, we will actually program everything using MPLAB X IDE version 3.50 and our Explorer 16 slash 32 board, along with our PIC 24 FJ 256 GA 110 chip. So first off, we need a little bit of setup. We have to download our data sheets. So make sure you've already downloaded not only the family data sheet for the, for the uh, actual chip, but also information on your Explorer board. The Explorer 16 has very specific pins that need to be utilized in order for us to actually use it properly. Now we're going to be picking up from our last project, so if you haven't followed along so far, we've used our includes, we've defined our, our number of oscillations, our prescalers, and so forth, and we set up a timer. None of this is going to be necessarily uh, needed, but the fact that we have covered now interrupts will be required, as we're going to be using interrupts to receive and send data. That being said, let's jump into our data sheets and figure out a little bit more about how we're supposed to be working with UART. First, I'm going to go into our Explorer 32, uh, 16 slash 32 schematic. So within this schematic is a lot of great information. It's really one of the first places you should go in working with the Explorer board. And specifically, I'm looking over here at the USB to UART or I squared C serial information. UART is not the only way for us to com use communication or to communicate between devices. There's also SPI and I squared C. We'll be covering them in future videos, but for right now we're concentrating on UART thanks to a special request by Zach Norris. Zooming in, we can start taking a look at what we have to deal with with the Explorer board. And specifically, we're really interested in this RX and TX, that is the transmit and receive portions of this. Now, by itself, that's not a whole lot of information. We see, okay, there's a pin 5 and a pin 6. And actually, if we take a look at a, an image of the board itself, this image here provided by Microchip, and we zoom in to, let's see, down here, here is actually our serial interface, and this does not look like a standard serial port. If you've ever worked with serial ports before in the past, they're going to look something a little bit more like this. Here we are. So this is more what you're used to with serial ports, and obviously that's a very large port to have on a device, and quite frankly, it's really something that's not included very often anymore. Um, it's used with things like RS-232 and UART communication, but once again, not terribly common unless you're in the server world or in the microcontroller world. What Microchip has done here is actually made a serial to USB chip here, and that means we get to plug in a second USB cable right here. So not only will you have your primary USB cable plugged in for our PIC kit on board for programming and power, but you're also going to have your uh, secondary USB for your serial information, which will be part of UART. But if you take a look here, this chip, this image isn't quite high res enough, but this chip is actually the chip that they're showing right here. And what we can see here is that UART receive and transmit are actually on pins five and six, and that translates to MCPRX and MCPTX. What does that mean, really? Because after that, we've got our resistor and then our, our 3.3 volts coming in. But we need to take a look at these jumpers over here to understand what's going on and to map them to our pins that our chip is going to work with. So MCPRX, here we go, MCPRX. That is going to be going to here, jumper 38, pin 2, and of course that maps to pin 50. And then MCPTX goes through this jumper and then maps to pin 49. And then if we zoom out and go to the second page and zoom on in, we can see pin 49 and 50 right here, 49 and 50. And those are the ones that we're going to be working with, RXB and TXB. If you happen to have your MP Lab open and you're working with a similar chip to my own that's supported with the MCC code configuration, we can click on that. And we can actually look here at pins 49 and 50, which it looks like from a previous project I had already mapped my UART channels to. So here you can see UART, receive and transmit, have been locked down to these pins and that's why they've turned green here. I am not going to rely on the uh, MCC part of this. Turns out a lot of chipsets are not um, compatible with this yet, or that is they haven't been made compatible by microchip. 
Therefore, we're going to do this from the ground up, writing everything in code so that you're most familiar with it. But if you happen to have a chip, such as the one that I'm working with, that is compatible, feel free to go ahead and lock those pins down. So if you look under port F, bit 5, we have 50, which would be our receive. And then we have under our transmit, under port F4, pin 49 would be our, tr our uh, transmit. Okay, well that's enough of looking at the Explorer board. Now we know which pins we're dealing with, 49 and 50 respectively. Next up, we should probably start looking at the UART manual to get a better understanding of how UART actually functions within the PIC chip itself. So let's jump on over here. And of course, we always start with the family data sheet. While it doesn't contain all the information we need, it's a great starting spot to get used to what's going on. So here, if we continue to move on down, we can see our PIC24 FJ256GA110. And if we read right here, we can see that it's a reprogrammable pin. Right there, I know that that means I'm going to need my peripheral pin select stuff to remap these ports to work with it, which is what we saw in the uh, MP Lab Studio over here just a few seconds ago. Scrolling down a little bit further, we can search for UART. Here it is under section 17, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, and click on that to take us right to the location. Now it tells you to go ahead and download that family data sheet. However, I'm going to warn you right now, this documentation is a tiny bit old, and that family data sheet is actually a much larger data sheet, which I called UART. And it's the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter UART data sheet, not only for this particular chip, but for an entire family of them. This is for the DS PIC33 slash PIC24 family reference manual. So do understand you're not going to find that exact PDF. And it specifically states within this document that this document supersedes the following document references. We do want to start here and take a minute to look at some of the important aspects of UART that we're going to need to understand. First of all, full duplex, so back and forth communication. There's an 8 or a 9-bit mode. We're going to be working with the 8-bit mode in these videos. And of course, our transmit and receive pins. You do have an option of parity, whether that's even, odd, or none. Then, of course, we have our stop bits, which indicates when we're done, one or two of those. These are all things we're going to have to set up in special function registers. Also to note is the fact that we have buffers that are going to hold our data that gets sent out as well as received. And very importantly, we have error detection for not only parity, framing, but buffer overrun. It's going to be very important for us to check these buffers to make sure that we're not messing anything up. Nine times out of 10, when things aren't working right, one of these errors is going to be popping up repeatedly for you on your UART display. Now, that being said, if we're trying to transmit and receive data, what are we transmitting and receiving data to? Well, we're going to be using a program called PuTTY that I've become familiar with thanks to my schooling. I've already installed it. It's right here on my desktop. But if you have not installed it yourself, let me show you where to go on a website. So going to your favorite search engine and typing in PuTTY Terminal, you'll see PuTTY.org. Let's go ahead there. Here you can download PuTTY yourself. I won't click this since I've done it already, but you can download and install PuTTY. When you do so and eventually open it up, you're going to get the following interface. Now I've already created a default UART Explorer 1632 save setting for me, but what you really need to understand about PuTTY is the following. We're dealing with serial information. So let's go all the way down here through connection type to serial and take a look at some of the different options we're going to be setting up in the following video. We have our COM port. That's something that I'm going to show you how to figure out in just a second. We have our baud rate right here, which right now is set to 115200, which is kind of high. We're going to lower this. We have how many data bits we have, the number of stop bits, our parity, and our flow control. Doesn't that look familiar? Didn't we just see this information inside the data sheet? Yes, we did. And these options need to match perfectly with the options that we end up selecting in the data sheet. Now, what about this COM port? Which one should we be using? So let's right click here and go to our device manager. The device manager is going to list for us all of our COM ports that we have open. And right now, actually, I don't have any. Nothing is popping up. What I am going to do right now is take my USB cable and plug it directly in to my serial or my USB to serial port on my Explorer board and we should notice a quick change. So I plug that in, it refreshes, and now I have a feature called ports, COM and LPT. If we open this up, we can see I have a Teensy USB serial and that's on COM port 5. 
That's obviously not COM port 3, so we should be changing that to 5 instead. If you would like to, we can go to the session portion of this category and save all of our settings right here by saying something like, uh, I don't know, temp video session and hit save. Now all those settings are saved for us in the future when we want to use them. All we have to do is click on one of our settings and hit the load button. Eventually, in the next video, when we actually start transmitting data back and forth, what you're going to end up with is a command line terminal window like this, and hopefully it's going to be populated with some sort of transmission and receival of data back and forth from our microcontroller. But that's not for this video. So continuing on, the first thing we need to understand is that we need to calculate our baud rate. And we do this through the BRG or UBRG or the UX BRG register control. This is something we have to do. This is some math that we're going to have to figure out. And it's going to be based upon what our frequency is. And then, of course, we use this information to figure out what our baud rate is. Or if we have a predetermined baud rate, we reverse this and figure it out the opposite way. But basically, what we need to do is figure out what our baud rate should be and how much off of it we are based upon our particular clock cycle. So for us, we're dealing with 4 megahertz because we have an 8 megahertz crystal. In this example here, and I'm not going to waste your time going through it, they desire a baud rate of 9600. And they show you exactly how they go through and calculate this. Remember, we're starting with an 8 megahertz crystal, which means that it's actually a frequency of 4 megahertz. You have that. And over here, we can see that we've used this equation. And by the way, there are two equations here, one for, let's say, the slow mode and one for the fast mode. So if we take a look, BRGH is equal to zero for this equation set and BRGH is equal to one for this equation set. We don't know what BRGH means yet. So let's scroll down a little bit further and find out exactly what that register does for us. Looking through this particular register, and there's only two of them for UART, so UX mode, we see BRGH is on bit 0, 1, 2, 3. So scrolling down to the third one, here we are, bit 3. We get to specify whether or not we're going to have a high baud rate mode or the standard mode. And there is a difference in between the two. Notice how in one, our frequency is divided by 4. On the other one, it's divided by 16. Quite a bit of difference in speed. So make sure you're using one that's best for your application. In our particular case, we're going to be working with zero and not one. Now, what other information is important for us to deal with? Well, the most important thing is to make sure that we have a very low error percentage. And in this particular case, if you're using a frequency of 9600 and you're having the same default values as they have put in here, when you do your calculations, you end up with an error rate of only 0.6. 1.6%, which is quite low, and you want to keep this as low as possible. The higher the likelihood of this error, the more likely the framing of the input going from one side to the other will be off, and you'll start to get errors. Microchip does a wonderful job of explaining exactly what you need to do to set things up with section 17.2, where it tells you you need to set up your data, your parity, and your stop bits, which once again is exactly what we saw inside of PuTTY. Both of these need to be in agreement for this to work. So go under connection, serial, and make sure we've decided to use the same values. In my case, I'm gonna go with their example. I'm gonna go ahead and use a baud rate of 9600. I'm gonna come back, make sure this is COM port five, go to my session and save it here to my temp video session. So if I load in a different session, I should have different values as you can see here slightly different values, my speed is different. If I come back over here and go to my temp video session, load them in instead, what are we gonna have? Well, now we've dropped down our baud rate to 9600 instead. We need to make sure our baud rate is set properly and we need to set up our transmit and receive interrupts if that's what we're working with. And yes, we will be working with interrupts. And if you missed the section on timer interrupts, please go back and watch that video. You have to enable UART, of course. We need to set up our interrupts we need to write our data out. And then of course, we just need to follow the next set of steps, enabling UART, enabling our interrupts, writing and reading data out and so forth. Now that's for transmission. There's also for receiving, which is very common to what transmitting is like, of course, it's just gonna have a different interrupt. Now there is far more to UART than what we're discussing here, such as transmitting in nine bit mode, breaking and syncing sequences and infrared support. We will not be covering those in this video.
What we do need to jump into now, though, is looking at the different registers. And there's only two with UART that we need to deal with, which makes it pretty simple. So here, let's take a look at what we're dealing with. Well, bit 15, the last one, is whether or not it's enabled. The next part is unimplemented. Then we have our stop and idle mode bit. Since we're not talking about idle mode, we're just going to set that to be zero. We have our IRDA, our infrared encoder and decoder bit. We're not dealing with that, so that's going to be zero. We have our mode selection, whether we're in simplex mode or flow control mode. Then we get to decide how we're actually going to control transmission and receival. Finally, what do we want to do whether or not we wake up, which we're not handling here, so no wake up enabled. We're not going to be um, sleeping in our mode. But really, it's these bits at the end, or I should say the beginning, that are pretty important. Our stop bit selection, our parity, and our baud rate. These ones, of course, match everything we saw with our putty terminal, as well as whether or not we are dealing with high speed or standard speed, which has to handle our equations that we saw before. We have our status and control registers. Most of these we're not going to need to concern ourselves with, such as the infrared portion of this. But the really important thing is to make sure that we check for errors. And of course, here we start with bit three with our parity error, framing error, or receive buffer overrun error bits. We'll want to check these to make sure that none of these conditions actually occur in code. Now, if you want to learn a lot more about UART and how it functions, I recommend taking a look at the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter UART datasheet for this particular family it is incredibly long, close to 60 pages, and features a tremendous amount of information on UART, how all the different areas work, as well as less abridged examples of how things work, as well as timing diagrams and so forth. Now I think that's enough information for us in this first video to begin implementing UART ourselves on our Explorer board using this particular chip. I'll see you then. Remember, if you liked the video, give it a like. If you don't, don't only dislike, but let me know what was wrong with it. And of course, always rem remember that if you want more content like this, please subscribe so I know there's interest. I'll see you all next time. So long. George out. Goodbye.